I want to start now by introducing our speaker and hear a little bit about what he's been up to in the kitchen garden so far this spring. Thomas Crowley is an advanced gardener in the Gardens and Grounds team at the U.S. Botanic Garden. He joined the garden in 2014 and helped to establish the kitchen garden in Bartholdi Park. He currently works with the outdoor collections in Bartholdi Park, which includes designing and maintaining the kitchen garden throughout the year. And we're so happy to have him with us today to answer your vegetable gardening questions. Welcome, Thomas. Hi. How are you doing? Hey. <laughs> doing great. Good. Uh, so thanks for taking the time to join us. It's officially March in Washington, D.C. You're getting ready to plant in the kitchen garden. Um, yeah. But you've been busy over the winter, too, um, kind of figuring out what, what it's going to look like this year. Wondered if you could start out just by sharing a little bit about your process for developing a planting plan for the spring and, and how you decide what's going to go in the kitchen garden. Yeah, sure. Um, I usually start out with a sketch. Well, before that even, I, I like to have all my seed catalogs laid out in front of me and um, go specifically through the stuff that I know does well in spring, like lettuces and members of the cabbage family, um, carrots even can be started pretty early. And um, I usually choose based on texture and color. Um, and I like to find things with short growing periods so that I can um, have things timed for the next garden I'm gonna be putting in. But after I look through and pick some seeds I like, um, some plant varieties I like, I'll sketch out uh, placement um, according to soil types that the plants like and sun exposure. And once I get that all laid out, I usually run it by a couple folks and see what they think. And, um, get a plan together. Thanks. And you shared with us um, an image of, of sort of the drawing that you put together. Grace is going to put that up now so people can take a look at what that looks like. Yeah, I, I like to have fun with it. Um, I, I try to make that into a piece of art too. It's not always exactly what the garden ends up looking like, but I'd say it's probably 85% there. Right, and I see that um, you called this spring and fall. Um, do you want to talk about that uh, a little bit? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, a lot of things that do well in the spring, I'd say almost everything that does well in the cooler spring temperatures also does well in the fall, sometimes even better. Um, so generally when I buy seed for the spring, I'm keeping fall in mind too. And since you get so many seeds per packet and we're working with um, smaller spaces, I just keep those seeds cool um, through the summer and then plant them again, sometimes in a different uh, layout during the fall. Thanks. That's a beautiful design. It's fun to see it in, in that way too. Um, so, so you talked about seeds and at this point in the season, a lot of people are starting seeds indoors or thinking about what they're going to direct seed outdoors. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about uh, your process for the kitchen garden? What do you usually start indoors versus outdoors and why? And then maybe how, how might that differ from what someone at home might be choosing to do? Yeah, like you said, it's, it, it can be a little different for us because we like to get stuff out as soon as possible. Um, but of course, you don't want to uh, run into that last frost state. Um, so around here, it's usually um, traditionally to be safe, we say late April. But I think last year it was the end of March. So usually here, I'm putting stuff in the ground early April, um, transplanting. And the things that I start outdoors are things like uh, lettuces and um, that's the generally lettuces and peas, uh, things like that. They can germinate in cooler weather. Like I think even under 50 degrees, um, lettuce seeds can germinate. But other members of the cabbage family like kale and collards, um, Brussels sprouts, they need the soil to be a little bit warmer. So I start those inside. So I direct sow the lettuces and plant the peas outside, and I start the members of the Brasca family, also known as the coal or cabbage family, inside. Um, tr I try to do it six weeks before the last frost date. Let's try to get them started six weeks before the last frost date. Got it. And I think we've got an image from um, some of the work you've been doing um, over at the production facility, trying to get um, some seeds started that are going to go into the kitchen garden. Um, so tell us what we're looking at here. Yeah, I, I'd like to take credit for planting it, but our talented growers at the PF um, started the seed for me this year. Um, and we've got some little um, yellow chard coming up. Um, there's a variety um, called uh, Baltimore. That's a really orange yellow color that I was looking for, but a lot of you have probably noticed that seeds are selling really fast. 
um, from a lot of vendors now. So, but we were able to get this nice yellow one. And the image to the um, other side is our germination chamber. It keeps things um, at a steady temperature and a steady humidity that makes the seeds pop up. And then we pull them out as soon as they germinate and uh, put them in a cooler uh, area, transition them out um, to the cold or to the cooler weather we have outside. Yeah, but we have a lot of stuff growing now. We have, um, I think Kenny started all of the um, kale, all of the collards. We had four different varieties of cabbage. Um, and I believe he even started some of the lettuces for me. Great, thanks. And then um, in terms of the physical kitchen garden beds outside, um, what have you been doing out there to kind of transition from winter to spring? What have you been removing? What have you been leaving? Um, anything you've been adding to the soil, things like that? Well, we've been really um, trying to keep a four season garden here, especially since we have the advantage of being in this um, urban heat sink. Um, things stay a little warmer in the middle of the city than they do in the outskirts. Um, so um, we were able to keep um, our artichokes going through the winter um, and also some other perennials. I think we had, um, there was some sea kale out there as well. So I've been cleaning up the perennials, kind of uh, pulling some of the dead leaves off. And um, even though they work well to insulate against the cold and um, pulling up all this stuff um, or harvesting the daikon radishes that we had growing through the winter, um, those did really <laughs> well in the cool weather. And um, also pulling up some, I think I had lemongrass in there and um, some rice that was left over. Just the foliage looked nice through the winter, so I left the um, spent plant in there. So just kind of cleaning up and getting the soil ready, um, adding amendments. Um, the fertilizer that we add now, a low nitrogen fertilizer, it's probably not going to be available to the plants for about a month, but putting it down now with some compost will give them that uh, extra bit of uh, boost they need toward the end of the season. Great, and I think we have a, a picture of, of what the kitchen garden looks like. Maybe uh, this was earlier this week or yesterday. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's kind of how it looks like um, getting ready for that spring planting and then looks like you're yeah. pulling some weeds. <laughs> yeah, I think there was some, uh, we had a lot of uh, mouse ear chickweed out there and some sorrel and some clover and um, maybe even speedwell. Um, we have some weeds you don't find everywhere just because it's such a, prime growing location. But yeah, pulling weeds was a big part of what um, I did to prep the beds. Um, yeah. And oh, and there was some sorghum left over from the, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, Poesi family was left in there. That, um, looked nice during the winter, but it's time to move on now. Great, thanks. Uh, yeah, it's great to have that background kind of of what you've been up to. Um, wh what I'd like to do now is, is turn it over to uh, our participants and see what kind of questions they have for you. Um, we have a few questions about seed starting. Uh, someone has asked, uh, when should you start peas? Peas? Yeah. Um, traditionally around here, um, anytime from mid-February on. Um, I get a little worried, like last year it was warm, uh, for a good bit, um, starting in February on. But I noticed some really low temperatures. Um, and I think the seedlings will be okay, as long as it doesn't drop too much below 20. But um, anytime from now on, you can stick seeds in the ground. I like to soak mine in water overnight first, um, and then pop them in the ground. And about, like with any seed, about three times the width of the seed um, into the ground. So you don't wanna put your little seeds too deep uh, but you want to make sure your bigger seeds like peas are a little bit deeper. So maybe a half inch to an inch. Great. And then someone asked about leeks and onions. They said they started leeks and onion from seed for the first time this year. Yeah. Um, can you give some information about how and when to plant those out? Yeah, I have. I, I've had the most success with members of the Allium family, like leeks and onions and garlic. Well, mostly leeks and onions when I start the seed inside and then transplant them out later. But I have direct sown um, onion. And if it was truly seed and not uh, sets, then it's gonna take a while. You're gonna need like almost the whole growing season before you're harvesting them. Um, but yeah, some folks put their onion seed out in the late fall and let it grow through the winter. We have some garlic in the garden now that we've uh, planted, I think it was early November. 
and it should be ready for harvest um, early summer. Was that was that the question? Like when when to plant it? Yep, you got yeah. it. <laughs> Um, then another person regarding seed starting talked about um, what should they do with seedlings that are indoors but seem to have stopped growing? Yeah, well, I guess a lot of that depends on where they are. If they're in a really cool place, um, then, you know, there are op optimal um, conditions for, for plant growth. So it, it could be too hot or too cold. Um, what I do with plants that look like they're slowing down as I um, gradually, if, if they have four leaves on them and it's time to move them outside, um, I would just go ahead with my plan and harden them off and um, plant them outside. And um, if they're not, hopefully they're not root bound, but if they are putting them outside um, after a gradual period of transition, um, hopefully it'll give them the space they need to continue growing. Um, but also I don't use a lot of, um, supplemental fertilizers like chemical fertilizers but um uh, about four weeks into into growing the seedlings you can apply um, an appropriate amount of fertilizer and see if that helps great um how about we we talk a little bit more about bed prep um Someone else uh, asked about onions and garlic. Um, they said last fall they planted yellow onions and hardneck garlic, um, then put two or three inches of straw on top, and the stems are now starting to emerge. Um, when should they remove the straw and how much? Huh. Um, the straw acts as insulation against the cold. It, you know, it doesn't necessarily um, keep them warm, but it, it works as a buffer to make sure that the temperature doesn't fluctuate too much. Um, so I would say, and this is my personal opinion, I'm sure there's a lot of different ones, I'd, I'd remove that um, now. Um, if it's a lot, if it's a thick layer of straw, then you could gradually remove, um, you know, half of it and then remove the other half um, a few weeks from now. Great. And but I'd say around now would be a, a, a fine time to remove it. Okay, good. Uh, another question about um, bed prep. Um, what would you do to prep heavy soil? Um, do you like adding compost, mulch, straw, um, a mix of those things? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what you could do in the fall, but then I'll tell you what you can do now. Um, if you want to prep it ahead of time, it's good to plant something like the oilseed radishes I was talking about. They actually end up growing down into the soils and, and breaking them up like as much as 18 inches down. Um, but also uh, members of the grass family will do that too. So if you were to sow some oats, they could um, break down or dig down into the soil and then you can till them in to the soil for uh, green waste or just cut them back and plant um, in between there. Um, but if you're just doing it now, there's a process called double digging that a lot of um, organic um, small farmers use uh, where they take a broad fork and they just basically push it down in the ground and just pull up big clods just to make sure that air and water can get down there. So it's not full on tilling, but it is preparing the soil um, and allowing oxygen and water to get down in there. But tilling is also an option if um, you're not adverse to it. Adverse to it. Thanks. Um, also regarding um, sort of fall to spring, someone said they applied compost last fall and are asking um, what, if anything, should they add now? Just the low nitrogen fertilizer that you mentioned? Yeah, I think so. And, and thank you for, for that question because as far as the other question goes with about hard soils, adding compost is also an excellent option, making sure you get organic matter in, into the heavy soils to break it up. But yeah, I think um, adding um, a low nitrogen um, fertilizer um, around now, yeah, it would be great. But depending on the compost, uh, you really might not need it. A lot of the um, root vegetables that we grow during the um, spring months, like turnips and, uh, and beets, um, I don't wanna say they're not heavy feeders, but I've had a lot of success growing those without any additional uh, amendment to the soil. Great, thanks. Um, but yeah, the leafy vegetables though, <laughs> I'm always thinking of <laughs> the leafy Great. vegetables, uh, they do benefit from some additional uh, nitrogen. So 
it wouldn't be a bad time to put some down if you wanted to. Great. Um, move to the, the topic of creating a planting plan. People like uh, checking out what your planting plan looks like. Um, yeah. Someone asked, what do you think about companion gardening? Um, does it really matter which veggies are planted adjacent to each other? Oh, man, there have been, been books written on this subject and really good books. Um, I personally don't adhere to companion planting, but I, I mean, it's uh, on good authority that carrots love tomatoes. But I haven't noticed a lot of difference as far as what's growing at the same time. What I have noticed is planting um, a legume, like a member of the bean family in a spot where you plan to have a heavy nitrogen user like corn really has a big effect. So if you plant soybeans one season, then plant corn the next season in that spot, you're gonna see a noticeable difference in, in your corn plants. Thanks. Um, then let's talk a little bit about pest management. Um, we have a few questions about that. Um, one person yeah. has a question on advice about how to deal with massive numbers of slugs. Yeah, I get asked about slugs a lot. And it's, it's interesting. I, I haven't had issues with slugs so much. Um, I'm not certain, but um, I have used um, diatomaceous earth for um, other soft bodied um, insects. And um, that's just a like physical mechanical way of, of deterring them to keep them away. So um, to my knowledge and my limited experience with slugs, that's been a nice low impact organic option for um, deterring them. All right, and then someone else asked, do you have any suggestions for um, natural non-toxic ways to better control weed growth, um, both in the garden and along paths? It's along paths, yes. Uh, here, uh, we've been using uh, a couple of different options. We have uh, vinegar, um, but not just like your store-bought vinegar, like a high acidity vinegar. Um, that works really well in paths, but you have to be careful because it's a broad spectrum um, weed control. It's gonna burn anything it touches. Um, you can buy store-bought vinegar and leave it in the sun to evaporate and that uh, intensifies the acidity. Um, and there are a couple of other products. Actually, there are a lot of, just look for anything OMRI um, certified. Um, and those are good for um, paths and areas in the bed that aren't close to the plants that you want. But um, as far as the garden itself, I do a lot of uh, hand, just mechanical removal. Um, uh, there, there are means of controlling, like I put down paper mulch which sounds like shredded paper, but it's actually just a sheet um, of, of uh, paper that ends up dissolving over the course of the season. Um, I have some weeds that I'm never gonna get rid of completely, but that keeps them in check um, through the season. So, so that's an option. Um, yeah, and also planting desirable plants that shade out the weeds, um, ground covers like, um, or plants that cover the ground like, like clovers. Um, sometimes that helps. It really depends on the weed. Like if it's a, a noxious weed, like um, field bindweed, it's probably not going anywhere and you're just going to have to learn to work with it. But if it's something like uh, just clover or chickweed, um, pulling it out, being diligent about that, if your area is not too large, you probably do the trick. Uh, kids in the neighborhood are also a good option. <laughs> Always a good option. Um, someone asked about beneficial insects. Do you use beneficial insects for pest control in the kitchen garden? Yeah, we have used, um, I, I always look out for the, the, um, the ladybird beetles. Um, they're always a, 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 the gardener's friend. Um, as far as like actually bringing them in, we've used a predatory mite for issues we've had with um, uh, pest called chili thrip, and we had some success with that. Um, they can be expensive on a smaller scale, um, and I have been known to find praying mantises and uh, ladybird beetles in other parts of the garden and kind of moving them over uh, into the vegetable garden, so that's also an option. Uh, but yeah, again, with pests, I find that I'm on my belly a lot in the garden, since it's a smaller area, plucking them off by hand. 
but I, yeah, I, I fully endorse any beneficials you can either find around your garden or order with some other gardeners in the neighborhood uh, and bring into the garden. Great, thank you. Um, someone had a question about whether you're integrating any vertical gardening in the kitchen garden this year. It's something we talk about a lot. Um, and we do a lot of traditional vertical gardening um, with trellises. So our beans and peas, um, we have those grow up, um, trellises and obelisks. But um, I haven't done like a full on green wall, but that's something that uh, I think would be really cool in the future. And it's always in the back of my head. Great. Um, somebody asked about uh, their potting soil grew mushrooms in it last spring and yeah. um, the many vegetable seeds they planted didn't grow well. Um, well not, the mushroom issue possibly a problem with the soil or, or what do you think might have happened there? So usually I tell folks when they find mushrooms in their potting soil or mulch to not worry about it. But I mean, as far as any sort of uh, phytotoxicity or any issues with um, them interfering with plant growth. I think it generally isn't an issue, but it could be an indication that the moisture is too high. And um, if you still have those plants, if you could pull one up and see what the roots look like, if they're white and sturdy, then um, the moisture is fine and we'll have to look at some other uh, avenues for what went wrong. But if you pull them up and they're, they're brown and they break off easily, it may be the mushrooms are growing there because the moisture level was too high. Yeah, that relates to, to another question someone asked, do you have any recommendations for what to plant in areas that are consistently wet, things that might do well? Um, I can't think of a lot of um, agricultural crops. You could try rice, <laughs> um, but generally things don't want to stay wet. And um, if you have an area in your yard that's consistently wet, you might want to just look at some, and I'm assuming, uh, the, the, the person asking the question is in the mid-Atlantic area. Uh, you might want to just plant a native plant like um, like turtle heads or um, or um, cart Lobelia cardinalis, um, some <laughs> some wetland uh, some wetland plants. But yeah, you could try rice. <laughs> See what happens. Cool. <laughs> All right, so we've got time for one last question, Thomas. Um, so we want okay. people to have fun experimenting in their vegetable gardens at home or in their community gardens, wherever they're growing. Do you have something that you're planning on experimenting with in your own vegetable garden this year? Yeah, you know, there's a plant I've run into that I, I haven't um, experimented a lot with. It's red orach. I think that's how you say it. It's in the same family as uh, spinach and amaranth. Um, it gets really tall and it's used just like spinach. So yeah, that's um, as far as being experimental goes, I think, uh, yeah, I'd like to try that. I had a uh, bad luck experimenting with another member of the, the Goosefoot family. Um, I guess I shouldn't bad mouth this plant variety, but you have to be careful with new varieties because sometimes they really like it in your garden and you'll see them again season after season. Um, husk cherries probably want to be careful with those. Yeah, I said it, yeah. But um, yeah, I think red orach. I'm going to try it out this year and see what happens. Cool. Well, I hope you can report back to us on how it goes. Um, yeah. and just want to say thank you so much for sharing your expertise with us today. And thanks to all of our participants for your great questions and taking some time out of your day to join us.